Chinese maritime patrol aircraft flying at threateningly low altitude. This is already the third time such a flyby was carried out in a month. As a power abuse probe continues, Yang Seng-te becomes the first former chief justice of the nation to be arrested on criminal charges. His allegations are clear and serious, and the court rules in favor of an arrest warrant as he may destroy evidence. The Bank of Korea adjusts this year's forecast for the local economy, citing a weakening global growth. The central bank lowers its figures to 2.6%, with the outlook for inflation downgraded as well. News Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. Seoul's Defense Ministry released proof of a Japanese warplane flying at a low altitude near a South Korean vessel on Wednesday. Five photographs back up the claims that the maritime patrol aircraft was approaching the warship in a threatening manner. Kan Yong has our top story. On Thursday, Seoul's Ministry of National Defense released five photographs taken from the Navy destroyer Tejoyang to back up its claim that a Japanese maritime patrol aircraft flew near the ship at a low altitude. Two pictures taken from the ship's thermal observation camera and one taken by the ship's camcorder show the Japanese airplane approaching. The other two photos are of radar data indicating that the Japanese plane was flying at an altitude of just 200 feet or about 60 meters. A day earlier, the defense ministry called the flight a provocative act. The Tejoyong was on a regular mission Wednesday near Korea's southernmost island of Iodo when the Japanese plane came as close as 540 meters. The Navy vessel sent multiple messages to the plane, saying it was flying in a threatening manner and asking that it change course. The fact that Japan has conducted another aggressive low-altitude flight, despite South Korea's clear requests that it prevent this from happening again, is an unambiguous provocation against a ship belonging to a military partner. Thus, we cannot help but question Japan's intentions, and we strongly condemn Japan's actions. Should this happen again, we will respond in line with our military's code of conduct. Hours later, Seoul's defense ministry called in the Japanese military attaché and lodged a strong protest. According to the South Korean military, Wednesday's low-altitude flyby was the third one just this month. The other two happened on the 18th and the 22nd. But Tokyo denies Seoul's claims, saying the plane was on a regular mission, that it was not flying in a threatening way, and that it was not at the low altitude South Korea claims. The latest incident has stoked the already rising tensions between the two countries. Only about a month ago, a dispute erupted over claims by Japan that another South Korean ship used its targeting radar on a Japanese plane while on a mission to rescue a North Korean boat, something Seoul says there's no evidence for. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. South Korea's National Security Council Standing Committee held the meeting this afternoon. During the session, they said good results came out of last Friday's Pyongyang-Washington high-level talks. According to the top office during the meeting chaired by President Moon's top security advisor, Jung yoo yong the NSC Standing Committee decided to actively support the second Kim Trump summit scheduled for late February so that it produces substantial results for the complete denuclearization of the peninsula and permanent peace. To that end, the committee said Seoul will maintain close cooperation with the U.S. and continue inter-Korean dialogue. Expressing serious concerns over Japan's recent threatening low-altitude flybys of South Korean warships, the Standing Committee members decided to sternly respond to prevent a repeat of such provocations. Pyongyang's top nuclear negotiator with Washington brief leader Kim Jong-un of the meetings he had during his recent overseas trip. Kim Yong-chol, who met with his American counterpart and the U.S. president, delivered Trump's letter to his North Korean counterpart. Woo Jung-hee fills us in on the latest. The North Korean leader's right-hand man, Kim Yong-chol, who met with U.S. President Donald Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Washington, has briefed Kim Jong-un on the results of those meetings. And Pyongyang state media reported that Kim Jong-un also received another letter from President Trump.
According to that report, Kim Jong-un said Trump has shown, quote, extraordinary determination and willingness. Kim also stressed that North Korea will wait with patience and take steps with the U.S. to move together towards their common ultimate goal. The North's top nuclear negotiator, Kim Yong-chul, spent three days in Washington last week. He's believed to have discussed where and when to hold the second Pyongyang-Washington summit. Another key talking point would have been what North Korea should do next and what the U.S. can give in return. Pyongyang is claiming that it has taken steps towards denuclearization. It has dismantled its Punggye-ri nuclear test site and Dongchang-ri missile engine test site, and so the U.S. has to ease sanctions. But the U.S. has been firm that sanctions can't be lifted until Pyongyang shows more concrete steps towards denuclearization. This gap in views has been the key reason for the months-long deadlock in the nuclear negotiations. But as they're determined to hold the summit, it's expected delegations from North Korea and the U.S. will continue meeting to reach a deal. Earlier this week, as Kim Yong-chul wrapped up his Washington visit, North Korea's vice foreign minister Choi Son-hee met with U.S. Special Representative on North Korea Stephen Began and South Korea's representative Lee Do-hoon for three days in Sweden. Additional meetings could take place. The White House has announced that the Kim-Trump summit will be held in late February, but the location of it hasn't been announced yet. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. Pyongyang appears to have changed the official in charge of handling working-level negotiations with the United States. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said at the World Economic Forum in Davos that Washington's special representative for North Korea had the opportunity to meet with his newly designated counterpart and that they discussed some of the issues toward fulfilling the Singapore Declaration. Stephen Began had his first face-to-face -face with the regime's vice foreign minister Choi son in Sweden just a few days ago. Many saw Che as his counterpart, but they only met recently, despite Began being appointed last August. South Korean media outlets speculate that the new official could be Kim hyuk Cho, the North's former ambassador to Spain. According to Yonhap News, he is likely to have had the chance to get to know his American counterpart recently while visiting Washington as part of a North Korean delegation. We turn the spotlight to the unprecedented arrest of a former Supreme Court Chief Justice. Yang Sung Tae became the first Chief Justice to be arrested as he faces dozens of charges mostly related to abusing his power. Yoon Jung Min gets us up to speed with the developments. The ex chief of South Korea's highest court is the first top level official in the nation's judiciary, sitting or former, to ever be arrested and imprisoned. In the early hours of Thursday morning, the Seoul Central District Court issued its arrest warrant for Yang Sung Tae, who was waiting for the court's decision at the Seoul Detention Center in Gyeonggi-do Province. The 70-year-old faces over 40 charges, most of which are related to abuse of power. Explaining his decision to issue the arrest warrant, the judge at the Seoul Central District Court said the allegations against Yang were clear and serious, and there are concerns he may destroy evidence. Yang will now attend trial hearings from the Seoul Detention Center. Since he was a former head of the judiciary, it's likely that he will be placed in a cell separate from other inmates, as was the case with former President Park Geun-hye, also detained at the center. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. Staying with the disgraced Chief Justice, now that he is in prison, eyes are on how the prosecutors made its case before the judge to get that arrest warrant issued. Choi Xiong zooms in on how the court made its decision. In a session that lasted almost six hours, the prosecution Yang and his lawyers made their cases for and against arrest. Yang said an arrest isn't justified, but this round went to the prosecutors. The court generally reviews four points before issuing a warrant. First, the allegations brought against the accused have to be clear, meaning that evidence links him or her to a crime. They also have to be serious or undermine the rule of law, as prosecutors put it, the very foundations of law. And the court should be able to see a risk that the accused might destroy evidence or flee. The judge said Yang satisfied all counts except the last one. Yang's defense seemed to have backfired. He consistently called evidence against him false or manipulated and blamed either his subordinates or lapses of memory. According to some experts familiar with the case, those denials and deflections of blame might have aroused suspicions in the judge that Yang could destroy evidence. 
Of course, Yang's guilt or lack thereof will be determined at trial. But this first test seems to indicate that the judge favors the arguments of the prosecution, so it might be a struggle for Yang and his team. Choi Xiong, Arirang News. The nation's central bank held its maiden monetary policy meeting of the year. The BOK lowered its growth outlook for the year and has widely expected kept its key rate steady. Kim Hyesung has the highlights from that session. The Bank of Korea forecasts the local economy to grow by 2.6% in 2019, down one-tenth of a percent from its earlier projection last October. It also cut its inflation forecast from 1.7% to 1.4%. We slightly lowered this year's growth forecast due to weakening global growth. Overall, it is similar to last year's growth rate. We also downgraded our inflation forecast mainly on plummeting global oil prices and the government's social welfare policies. This projection comes two days after the central bank said Korea's economy grew at a six-year low of 2.7 percent in 2018. The bank expected 140,000 new jobs to be added this year, down from last year's projection of 160,000. BOK Governor Lee Ju-yeol also expressed concerns about slowing global growth, including in the U.S. and China, which could hurt Korea's exports. Already, data by the Korea Customs Service show that between January 1st and 20th this year, overseas shipments fell by 14 percent on year and exports to China dropped by double digits. Sales of semiconductors, a key driver of growth in recent years, tumbled almost 30 percent on year in January. On slowing global and domestic growth, the Bank of Korea's Monetary Policy Board decided unanimously to keep its benchmark interest rate unchanged at 1.75 percent. Construction investment is expected to continue to slow down this year. And now Korea's main driver of growth, exports, is likely to slow down too. It remains unclear if government spending can offset those and cushion Korea's growth, like we saw in the fourth quarter last year. At the same time, a less hawkish U.S. Federal Reserve has eased pressure on the BOK to change its key rate in January. The Bank of Korea said it'll maintain its accommodative monetary policy stance for the year and said it'll make its rate decisions by closely monitoring domestic growth and external uncertainties like the global slowdown and the U.S.-China trade spat. Kim Hyesung, Arirang News. Fitch maintains its rating for South Korea at AA minus, the global credit ratings agency's fourth highest level. In an online report Thursday, Fitch said its outlook for Seoul is stable, citing robust external finances and a solid macroeconomic performance. It did, however, point to rising future challenges for the nation, including the evolving geopolitical risk from its relationship with Pyongyang, low productivity stemming from the rapidly aging population, and trade uncertainties due to the slowing global economy. The agency projected annual growth this year and next of 2.5%. Continuing his domestic tour aimed at boosting local economies, President Moon Jae-in visited Daejeon today. There, the South Korean leader stressed the importance of developing new technologies so the country can be a trailblazer in the era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Hwang Ojun shares with us his remarks. Back in the 1960s, the only thing Korea could make with its own technology was a radio, while America was about to send a man to the moon. But now, thanks to the emergence of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, President Moon Jae-in says South Korea can compete with the best of them. During his visit to the city of Daejeon, the fifth leg of his national tour of local economies, President Moon met with scientists and researchers, and he insisted that the nation is teed up perfectly to become a global leader. President Moon pledged active support from the government to achieve several things. It will aim to boost the nation's data market to about 26.6 billion U.S. dollars by 2023. It will set up three new advanced education centers by 2022 in order to cultivate more than 10,000 experts in artificial intelligence. 
and it will create an environment that encourages R&D in basic science by expanding funding to 2.2 billion U.S. dollars by 2022 from the current 1.5 billion. The government will also work to increase investment in leading businesses, including so-called super-connected intelligence, smart factories, and fintech. President Moon asked the city of Daejeon, home to many research institutes, to lead South Korea into the fourth industrial revolution. Before returning back to Seoul, President Moon paid a visit to the Korea Aerospace Research Institute to encourage the researchers there. He congratulated the institute on the successful launch last November of the nation's first homegrown space rocket engine, the Nuriho. He also stressed the importance of Korea's independent technology and urged the researchers not to be afraid of failure, but to move forward in order to achieve success. Hong Jun, Arirang News. It's been more than four years since South Korea and Canada's FDA took effect. Latest data shows Seoul's trade volume with that country grew by more than 30 percent since thanks to strong car exports. According to the Korea Customs Service, the total amount of trade between the two nations last year came to 11.5 billion U.S. dollars, up from 8.6 billion in 2015. The agency attributed the increase to more shipments of local passenger cars after tariffs were reduced and finally eliminated in 2017. Korea's semiconductor giant SK Hynix posted record operating profits in 2018. However, the numbers for the fourth quarter paint a concerning picture for the year ahead. Koduni helped us look beyond the digits. It was another record-breaking year for the world's second biggest memory chip maker. SK Hynix posted record sales and operating profits for the second straight year in 2018. Total sales were estimated around 35.9 billion U.S. dollars, up from the previous year's 26.7 billion dollars. And more importantly, operating profits came at $18.5 billion, up from $12.2 billion in 2017. The company attributed the figures to strong sales of memory chips due to high demand from data centers and increased production of high-performance mobile devices. However, the numbers in the fourth quarter paint a worrying picture for this year. During the October to December period, the operating profit dropped to around $3.9 billion, US dollars, a more than 30 percent on-quarter fall. This is the first time since the first quarter of 2018 that the company's quarterly operating profit has been below the $4 billion mark. Analysts point to sharp declines in Chinese demand for electronic products and the recent falling orders from data centers. For this year, falling prices is another problem. Server DRAM contract prices are expected to drop by more than 20 percent in the first quarter of this year, according to market tracker DRAM Exchange. Meanwhile, SK Hynix rival Samsung Electronics is set to release its final earnings report for 2018 next week. Samsung has stunned the market earlier this month with an estimated 29 percent drop in quarterly profit compared to the previous year. Ko Juni, Arirang News. Hanlyu, or the Korean wave, has spread to the global gaming industry. The nation's exports of related products grew more than 80 percent in 2017 thanks to growing overseas demand for the country's mobile games. According to a report by the Culture Ministry and Korea Creative Content Agency, Seoul's game export revenue reached nearly six billion U.S. dollars in 2017, up 80.7 percent from a year earlier. The industry's total outbound sales volume has been growing at a steady pace but it skyrocketed in 2017 thanks to the growing popularity of local mobile games. Revenue growth in the market continues to grow, and South Korea ranked fourth in taking a bite of that global pie with 6.2% in 2017, trailing behind the U.S., China, and Japan. Lunar New Year period is just around the corner, which means hundreds of thousands of South Koreans will be traveling to their hometowns to spend the holiday with their families. To help deal with this mass exodus, Seoul City will enforce special transportation measures starting next week. From February 3rd to 6th, the number of express buses on the motorway will be increased by 22 percent to accommodate a daily average of 130,000 passengers. Buses and subway will operate until 2 a.m. on the 5th and 6th when the demand for these public transports is expected to peak. Late night buses will run until 3.45 a.m. Korea, Railway, Korea Railroad Corporation rather will allow children under six to board trains for free or at a discount. Families traveling together can also receive a 30 percent off regular prices if two members of the group are under the age of 25. 
For details on discount rates, go to the CoreRail website or download its smartphone app. Cloud seeding is already used in China and Thailand to tackle air pollution. Tests will be conducted on whether the technology can be implemented in the battle against fine dust here in the nation. Hong Yu sheds light on the government's latest measure to help clear the air. South Korea is launching a pilot program on Friday that aims to create artificial rain to try and help reduce fine dust. The Korea Meteorological Administration and the Ministry of Environment explained that planes will fly over the western coastline of Gyeonggi-do province, spraying clouds with silver iodide that causes water droplets to form. China, with an advanced technology for creating artificial rain, found out that more than 10 millimeters of rainfall is needed over a three-hour period to see a 10 percent reduction of ultra-fine dust density. This means that the amount of rain that can be created is what matters in an artificial rain test. But China, even with its artificial rain-producing missiles and tanks, is struggling to increase precipitation. Thailand, on the other hand, sprayed 3,000 liters of water into the air but failed to see any effect. Then they moved to using drones to make rain. For Korea, the days that such tests can be carried out are rare because when fine dust settles over the country, there are no rain clouds as the atmosphere is under the influence of an anticyclone. So it's important to customize the technology for Korea's climatic properties. On Friday, the density of fine dust will be measured after cloud sitting starts producing rain. The result of the first test will be announced on Saturday. Hong Yu, Arirang News. A South Korean ice-breaking vessel has rescued 24 Chinese researchers stranded in Antarctica. This is the fourth such mission by the Araon in its decade of service. Cha sang mi has the full story. The South Korean government sent the Araon on Monday to save 24 Chinese researchers trapped in the South Pole. The Araon is the first South Korean-built icebreaker. The Chinese nationals had become stranded near South Korea's Antarctic research station Changbogo after their own icebreaker crashed into an iceberg and couldn't pull through. China's maritime ministry said it seemed like there was no way to evacuate the 24 Chinese researchers working on an expressible island near the Changbogo research station. They asked for South Korea's Araon to help in their rescue. After a voyage of three days, the Araon arrived at the site but could not dock since there were no facilities. Each of the researchers had to be lifted onto the ship by a South Korean helicopter. The Araon is taking the Chinese delegation to New Zealand's Littleton Harbor and is scheduled to arrive on February 4th. The Araon has been researching the Arctic and the Antarctic since it was commissioned in 2009. The vessel gained worldwide fame from the four times it successfully rescued people operations, the first time being the crew of an ice strike in Russian fishing boat, the Sparta, in 2011. Cha sang -mi, Arirang News. Time to turn to Michelle Bach at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, the sky was clear relatively, but the weather is expected to turn quite cold again. Yes, Daniel, now the mercury will only be slightly lower than today, but the constant wind will make us shiver tomorrow. And the temperatures will plunge below the seasonal average by Saturday and boost up again on Monday. So bundle up until then. And Friday afternoon in the northern parts of East Asia will generally be under sunny spells due to the influence of high pressure front. However, now there are some chances of snow in the east coast of Kawanda province and also on Jeju Island into the evening. And checking out the readings in detail, you should be dressing warmly for your morning commute tomorrow as temperatures will be freezing cold. Seoul will be kicking off at minus 5 degrees Celsius. And into the day, Seoul will be rising up to 3 degrees while the southern regions are expecting milder conditions. And next week, there is a bit of precipitation in the forecast for the central region, but temperatures will remain stable without extreme fluctuations. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
These are the stories we could pack into tonight's edition of Arirang News Center. As always, thanks for staying with us.